Okay. Thank you everyone for attending. Uh, I'm Rich Ozer and here's Gerald McKeegan and uh, we're here at the Chabot Space and Science Center and next to our 36 inch research telescope fondly known as Nelly. Um, unfortunately, the humidity has hit 85%. I think it's exactly 85%. And uh, we can't open the observatory when the humidity reaches that point because otherwise we end up with a puddle of water on our primary mirror and uh, nobody likes that. So uh, we've got some other things to talk about. Uh, Gerald's got a presentation, so I'm gonna turn it over to Gerald. Gerald, you could turn on your mic. I will shut mine, which will make everyone happy. All right. Well, we're actually now up to 90%. So it's definitely not a good night for observing with the telescope. A um, couple of things I wanted to cover tonight. Uh, first of all, I think a lot of you know that uh, our 36 inch telescope, uh, when we're not doing public observing programs, uh, is also a research telescope. <clears throat> and our main uh, project is to search for and track near-Earth asteroids. And we are part of a global network that does this work. Uh, literally about 300 observatories around the world, both professional and amateur, who uh, do tracking of, of asteroids. And it's a lot of fun. We all communicate with each other via emails. So I'm frequently getting emails from Europe or Asia or wherever. Um, and it's mostly about asteroids and the occasional comet. But recently we had another object to track. And uh, as I think some, most of you know, the Mars 2020 Perseverance uh, spacecraft was launched on Thursday morning and uh, it's on its way to Mars. And it became a new interesting target for a lot of these guys to be tracking. So what I wanted to start out with here is to share my screen and show you a, um, an image taken by an Italian astronomer who's part of our network. Uh, let's see if I can get this up here. Uh, Richard, tell me if, I'm, if you're seeing this. I'm showing... Share screen right there. There we go. Oh, Richard disabled me here. So hang on here. We got to do a little manipulating with the computer. All right. Okay. Yeah, there we go. All right. So can you see that? All right. And let me hit, there we go. Okay, so this is the image taken by uh, one of the uh, observatories in Italy. And uh, it's, it's not a very clean image. Normally we do some work to clean up these images. The horizontal streak that you see across the middle is actually an artifact in the optics of the observatory. But you see two bright streaks, one on the far left and a brighter one on the right. These are the spacecraft and the upper stage booster from the Mars 2020 mission. Uh, these images were taken about 12 hours after Mars 2020 launched, after it had been inserted into the transfer orbit that takes it from the Earth <clears throat> to Mars. Um, the spacecraft, uh, the rover is actually enclosed in a, a, like a little capsule called an aero shell. And it's attached to what's called a cruise stage. And that assembly is the dimmer uh, streak that you see on the left. On the right, you see the Centaur upper stage, which is what boosted it into that transfer orbit, took it out of Earth orbit and into the transfer orbit that takes it to Mars. Once the Centaur upper stage did its work, it's no longer needed, so they eject it. 
and you can see that it's a much uh, bigger, brighter object, so it shows up brighter in the screen. But if you look carefully at that uh, streak, you'll notice that it fluctuates in brightness. And that's because as this image was being taken, this is uh, about a 30 second image. Uh, as this image was being taken, the booster was tumbling. And so it, it alternates bright and dim and bright and dim as it's going along. Now, the reason they're not both going in the same line, that's actually deliberate. Uh, when they launch uh, any kind of a spacecraft to Mars that's going to land on Mars, that spacecraft has to be uh, sterilized before launch. And they do that to prevent contamination of the planet. Uh, we would hate to get into a situation where we discovered life on Mars only to realize that it was contamination that was brought to Mars by a rover of some kind or some lander. So there, there are some very strict procedures that NASA uses to sterilize any spacecraft that's going to touch Mars. The uh, Centaur booster is not going to land on Mars, but there, if, if you're not careful, there is always the chance that it might hit Mars. So there is a deliberate effort uh, to deliberately deflect the booster so that it goes on a different path than the Mars uh, um, 2020 spacecraft. So it will safely pass far away from Mars and continue on out um, and eventually go into orbit around the sun. And, and that's done deliberately to protect the environment of Mars from contamination. So anyway, that's Mars 2020. There's a, another interesting event that has happened today. Um, most of you may recall that about, uh, about two months ago, uh, the uh, SpaceX Crew Dragon uh, took off from Cape Canaveral, uh, actually from Kennedy Space Center, and uh, flew up to the space station. Uh, two astronauts, Bob Behnken and Doug Hurley, uh, rode it up to the space station. This was the first time American astronauts were launched from American soil in an American spacecraft since the year 2011. Uh, Doug and Bob have been on the space station now ever since then, and today was time to go home. So at 4.35 this afternoon, they boarded their spacecraft, which is the Crew Dragon. This is the Crew Dragon still attached to the uh, space station, and they climbed aboard earlier today. Uh, got themselves all ready, and at 4.35 uh, this afternoon, they detached from the space station to get ready to return to home. Um, so you see the, the Crew Dragon spacecraft, the nose cone has been lifted up uh, to expose the attach port where they attach to the space station. Uh, you see the capsule Behind it, you see what they call the trunk. The trunk is actually has some avionics in it. It has the electrical power system. Uh, that dark panel that you see there, that's actually a solar panel for generating uh, power. I've got a diagram. And they, like I say, they climbed in uh, this afternoon uh, to get ready to return to Earth. Uh, this is a, kind of a diagram of the spacecraft. Uh, you see the trunk, which is the lower portion. The trunk has the uh, solar panels, which provide electrical power, charging the batteries in the, the main spacecraft. Uh, before they uh, return to Earth, they will uh, eject the trunk. And between the trunk and the service section of the spacecraft is the heat shield. And that's what's going to protect the astronauts when they re-enter the Earth's atmosphere. So right now, this whole assembly is still in orbit around the Earth. And they're making some subtle changes to separate from the space station and get into a lower orbit from which they will eventually uh, return to Earth. Um, I might point out if you're outside tonight and if you can see this, the sky, we, we've got bad weather up here and I think most of the Bay Area is under a blanket of fog. But if you're somewhere where you can see the sky 
at about 1020 this evening, if you look towards the west, southwest part of the sky, you will see the space station uh, flying overhead. And if you look carefully, you may see the, uh, the crew dragon uh, behind it. It'll be quite a ways behind it, but you, it'll be on the same flight path. So uh, you want, want to check that out. That will start at about 920, or I'm sorry, 1020 this evening for the Bay Area. Unfortunately, it's, you'll only be able to see it for three minutes because after three minutes, both the space station and the crew dragon are going to fly into the Earth's shadow and you won't be able to see it anymore. So, uh, like I say, they are right now in orbit. They're adjusting their orbit to get themselves lined up for their uh, landing, which is actually a splashdown in the ocean. Um, NASA had picked seven possible splashdown sites uh, around Florida. Uh, some of you may have heard that there is a hurricane uh, hitting Florida right now. It's hitting the uh, east coast of Florida. So the three uh, Atlantic landing sites have already been ruled out because they're gonna, they're going to be in the middle of the hurricane when when the time comes. Uh, so right now the plan is to land at the far left site that you see in this image, the Pensacola landing site, with the Panama City landing site as an alternate, and they will splash down into the ocean. And there are recovery teams that are already in the area, uh, both uh, uh, ships and jet skis and things like that, all standing by waiting for the, the spacecraft to come down. Um, this will be the first time a crewed Dragon has landed, but uh, SpaceX has been flying an uncrewed cargo version of the Dragon for several years now. And when it returns to Earth, it also splashes down in a very similar way. So this is an image of one of the uncrewed crew dragons uh, landing in the ocean. And you can see the guys on jet skis are all racing toward it. Um, and that's what's going to happen tomorrow. Uh, landing time is scheduled for 1148 a.m. tomorrow morning Pacific time. So uh, if you want to check out NASA TV, they will cover it. Uh, you'll get to see the, the splash down. And so far, as of uh, just about an hour ago, the last time I checked, everything was going well. Uh, they had already made a couple of the, uh, what they call phasing burns to get themselves into the correct uh, orbit. And uh, things are going well. So anyway, we have that to look forward to. So that's it for my PowerPoint show here. I got some questions for you. Okay. Let me know the answer. Um, Getting back to the Mars mission that uh, you were talking about, is there anything, uh, what's notable in terms of the science packages on this mission? Uh, what's different about this one from the previous Mars mission? Well, this is another rover, very similar to the rover that's already on Mars. Uh, the Curiosity rover is on Mars. It's a car-sized rover uh, that uh, uses a radioisotope thermal generator for power so it can last a long time. And it has been exploring Mars since I believe 2012. The new rover, which is uh, called Perseverance, uh, is very similar in appearance. It's actually five inches longer, uh, but it has a mass similar to, to what Curiosity has. And some of the instruments on it are very similar, but there are some differences. Uh, one of those differences is that it has an actual sample collection uh, system uh, at the end of the remote arm. It's got a remote arm that it can extend out. It's got different tools on that arm. Uh, the one on, on uh, Perseverance is much more robust, has more capability than the one on Curiosity. And one of the things that it has are these little tool tubes uh, and Perseverance will collect samples from the surface of Mars, uh, grind them up and drop them into these little tubes, which will it will then store in a storage compartment uh, on the side of the spacecraft or the, the rover. The intent is that on some future mission, those samples will be retrieved and returned to Earth. So that's one of the things that's different. 
Another thing that's different is that Perseverance will have two microphones on it. Now, the atmosphere on Mars is very thin. It's one one hundredth the uh, atmospheric pressure here at sea level on Earth. So it's, for all intents and purposes, we would think of it as a vacuum, but it is an atmosphere. They do have winds, they do have clouds, uh, dust storms, and so on. Um, so there's a chance that there will be some sounds. And so there are two microphones on Perseverance uh, that will detect sounds. Uh, some of the instruments on Perseverance are more attuned to actually searching for the conditions that would be uh, suitable for life. Uh, so this is a, a, a greater effort to actually search for past or present life on Mars. But one of the coolest things on uh, Perseverance is it's carrying a helicopter. So underneath the rover, there is a small helicopter. It's uh, got two counter rotating blade sets and it's all folded up and attached to the bottom of the rover. And after the rover lands, it will unfold itself and detach from the rover. Then the rover will drive away, get out of the way. And then the helicopter is going to take off and fly around transmitting whatever it's seen back to the rover, which will then send it back to Earth. Now, this is the first time they're going to try a rover or a helicopter on Mars. There's been a lot of discussion in the past about whether or not a helicopter would even work on Mars. Uh, so that's what they're going to be testing. So it it's, doesn't have a lot of capabilities, mostly just a camera to look around. But the intent is to test whether a helicopter can work in Mars's thin atmosphere. Now, so, is, is the idea that uh, after it flies around for a bit, it then goes back onto the ground and the rover drives back on top of it and picks it up again? Or uh, is it a one-time flight? No, it's, it, it's not a one-time flight. It's probably going to fly around quite a bit and land at different places and look around and send camera images back to the rover. It's a, it's a way for them to survey the area around the rover and get a much better idea of what the terrain is going to look like around the rover. So when they start planning their drives, uh, the, the helicopter will help. The helicopter has its own power source. It has a solar panel on its on the top of its rotor, uh, which will keep the batteries charged. So it, it should make several flights over the course of however long it, it remains operational. Uh, I suspect eventually dust will, will cover those solar panels and it won't be able to generate enough power anymore. But until that happens, you know, no reason why they can't keep flying it. That's pretty neat. Yeah. Um, is, uh, is the uh, landing site different in nature than the previous landing sites? Is it closer to the poles or anything like that? Uh, um, if you're familiar with uh, a feature on Mars called Certus Major, uh, if you look at pictures of Mars, especially pictures taken by smaller telescopes, you'll see a kind of a triangular shaped uh, dark region uh, uh, extending up from the southern part of Mars. And that's called Certus Major. And where they're landing is a crater called Jezero Crater, which is a very large kind of flat crater that has, you know, spacecraft are, are orbiting around Mars and taking lots of pictures of the surface of Mars. And what they see is both an inflow and an outflow channel from an old river that there's a, an inflow um, channel or, or dried riverbed, if you will, with a delta region flowing into Jezero Crater. And then there's another one flowing out of uh, Jezero Crater. Now, there's no water left flowing anymore, but you see the, the remains of what was once a river flowing into and filling the crater and then flowing back out again. So we know that it was once a lake. And so you have that combination of water plus chemistry plus sunlight and warmer conditions three and a half billion years ago. 
So the thinking is it's a very good candidate for where life may have at one time existed. So that's why they've picked that location. It's relatively close to the, uh, you know, there, there's, it's, that's actually an upside down image. It's of, an upside down yeah, image, but yeah, it's the best yeah. I could find it. A quick, yeah, uh, yeah. well, I don't yeah. know. There's no upside down in space. Yeah. Yeah, and you're actually seeing uh, the uh, Certus Major region. Yeah, this is Certus Major over here. Yeah, right. Hellas Basin is south of that, so that kind of roundish, bright area that you see to the south of it, which is up in this image, uh, that's called Hellas Basin. Uh, But anyway, if you look at uh, Certus Major, that dark area there, uh, down to the left edge near the, the end of it is where Jezero Crater is located, and that's where they're going to be landing. There we go. Yeah, yeah. All right. All right, enough of my up, upside-down images, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you'll see, when, when you see images taken by astronomers, they are often upside-down. In other words, south is up and north is, is down, and that's because a lot of uh, telescope optics flip the image over and so we see it that way uh if if you're used to looking through a telescope and seeing north up and south down it can be very disconcerting to see another image where they're flipped over the wrong way so all right um we can open up uh if anybody's got questions in general about what we've been talking about tonight or if you have any uh, astronomy questions in general Feel free to ask. I am monitoring the uh, Facebook feed right now. Um, also, thank you all who uh, have made donations tonight. I uh, really appreciate it. Uh, you were able to do that by clicking the little heart button next to the comment bar on our Facebook page. Um, it goes to help uh, keep these programs going and helps the center during these difficult times. Um, if you are able to see outside, uh, of course, like, again, at 1020 is when the space station will come by. But uh, if you can see the sky, uh, you'll notice that the moon is right now in between Jupiter and Mars. It's a little bit lower than the two planets, but it's almost midway between Jupiter and Mars, which will be in the southeastern sky. And it's a, it's a waxing gibbous moon. All right. I have a question here. What are some of the things you've been most excited to see in the telescope in recent years? Well, we've seen so many things through the telescope and really no matter what we look at, there's always, uh, there's always some interesting aspect and some degree of amazement. Um, Everybody's got their own personal preference of what they like to look at. And some people uh, really like to look at planets um, and uh, all of our, three telescopes here at Chabot are excellent instruments for looking at uh, Saturn and Jupiter. Uh, Nelly has very high magnification, so on a really good night, we can get a lot of detail uh, uh, looking at Saturn and Jupiter. And our long refractors uh, are designed for that type of uh, observing. You know, we get beautiful color and beautiful uh, 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 detailed images from those scopes as well on a good steady night of good atmospheric seeing. Um, Personally, I like looking at galaxies and uh, Nelly's a phenomenal instrument for galaxies. We get a lot of magnification. We can see a lot of detail. Uh, I'm I'm amazed at what I can get from a 30 second image. A 30 second image to this telescope gives me as much uh, information to my eye as, you know, 10 minutes through a smaller personal telescope. And uh, uh, the aperture of the instrument is really uh, a, a joy to work with. Um, so I don't know. It really depends. It's personal preference on uh, on what you'd like to look at. How about you, Gerald? What do you like looking at? You like looking at little dots. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> my, my, my wife teases me about that all the time, is, you know, that I get too much of a thrill out of seeing little dots moving across the screen. So yeah, I, I'm the, the guy that does the asteroid uh, work uh, with Nelly. Uh, and it's pretty nice because it's relatively instant gratification. You know, if you find them, you'll know it right away because you can see them moving across the sky. Uh, then you got to do the work to actually get the data and everything. But, you know, it's, it's pretty satisfying. But, you know, I'm up here 
back in the day when we were uh, open to the public every Friday and Saturday night, we would quite often get people up here who had never seen a planet through a telescope, had never looked at the moon through a telescope. Um, and they're pretty thrilled the first time they see it, you know, especially Saturn. People, you know, they, they, they've seen pictures and books and on the internet of Saturn, but to see it with your own eye through a telescope and actually be able to see those rings, see the shadow of, of Saturn on the rings, um, see the banding across the surface or the, the outer cloud layer of uh, Saturn. Uh, it's pretty amazing. And we get some pretty excited exclamations when people see it for the first time. So that's always fun. Mute. Let me unmute myself here. A couple more questions. Uh, well, we don't have a library of pictures to show. Uh, there are times where we're able to look at Venus through this telescope, and um, we will in the future and be able to show you Venus live. I don't have a photo I could show you uh, yeah. uh, on, Venus, on my Venus is a, right now, unless Gerald does. No, know. Venus is a morning star yeah. right now. So. Yeah, it's, 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 so we have to wait several months until we're going to be able to see it in the evening again. Uh, we did have, I do have a question about Neowise. Uh, I live in the town of Sonoma and haven't been able to find Neowise yet. Have I missed it? Kind of. Um, it's, it's certainly not a naked eye object anymore. Uh, you would have to find it with a telescope at this point. Um, you probably wouldn't see much of a tail anymore. It would be more of a um, kind of a fuzzy, fuzzy little cloudy object. Uh, uh, several times larger than a, than a star in, uh, in diameter, but uh, you pretty much missed it. So um, the good news is there's 50 billion photographs of it on the internet. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it's probably the most photographed astronomical object um, I've ever seen. So um, I would certainly look through uh, what people have been able to capture through their cameras. Um, another question. You know, is, if you're oh, go ahead. sorry, sorry. Um, if you're poking around on Chabot's Facebook page, you'll find an image that was taken by uh, an East Bay Astronomical Society member, Wes Chang. Uh, he got this really great close-up image. We showed it last week, uh, and it's on Chabot's Facebook page. Uh, just a perfect image showing the, the nucleus of the comet, the particle tail, and the ionized gas tail. Uh, and it's just just a great image. So you might want to hunt around for that. If you, if you can't see it anymore with binoculars or a telescope, there's always pictures to look at. Uh, somebody asked if uh, the planet Uranus is visible right now. Um, the planet Uranus comes up uh, right around when the Pleiades comes up. It's uh, yeah. It's actually in close to opposition, I believe. And yeah. it's pretty bright. Yeah. Uh, it's at magnitude five and a half, which is actually exceptionally bright for uh, that planet. And uh, um, it's at, and not a bad target for maybe later in the month when we don't have a moon. Yeah. Um, the, the only problem with, the, with both uh, uh, Neptune and Uranus is that uh, they are, even in this telescope, they're little, small, little dots. You can yeah. see that there's a disk there. You can see that they have color. Yeah. Uh, but that's about it. They do have a really unique color. That's what's yeah. neat about it. Yeah. You can really, you can really see that it's different than everything else in the sky. Um, let me see. Oh, Jose says, I'm looking at Jupiter with my CPC 1100. Amazing view of the moons. Uh, good choice of telescopes. I have a C11, which is the same <laughs> telescope. Um, and uh, I'm glad you're getting a good view. It's certainly better than the view we're getting because our observatory is closed. Um, humidity's too high here. It's probably better down below or further inland. Um, what kind of software do we use for image processing? Is it similar to what amateurs use for stacking images, et cetera? Absolutely the same stuff. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, you know, we, depending on who's using the telescope, maybe using different, different uh, products. Uh, when Gerald uh, shoots in uh, his, his images, um, you use Maxim DL, right? No, uh, I use CCD Soft from Software ah, okay. Bisc. There you go. CCD to, to, soft to, is... Yeah, to control the camera, and yeah. then I use Astrometrica to process the images to, for the asteroid work because 
that's kind of specialized work. And Got it. I use, uh, um, uh, with the DSLR, I use Backyard EOS. Sometimes I use Astrophotography Tool, APT. And if we have enough images to stack and process, I'll do all that in PixInsight. Yeah. Um, Richard is much more into astrophotography than I am. I, I take the images of the asteroids. I don't care if they don't look pretty. I just care if I can see the asteroid in it. Like I said, and, you like your dots. And, and okay. you know, I don't want to spend hours processing those images. I want to get the data and, and move on. <laughs> All right, let's see. Uh, like, like we said earlier, we're, we, the telescope um, is not able to be used tonight because we're in over 90% humidity. And once it hits 85%, we can't open the observatory. So we really don't have, we, we showed whatever pictures we had earlier for the, uh, uh, Mars and spacecraft presentations, but we don't have other images for tonight. Um, and I think, let's see if there's any more questions. Oh, how do I best prepare uh, for the meteor shower? Well, the next big meteor shower is going to be the Perseids, right? Right. Yes. What's the, date? The, the night of the 11th into the morning of the 12th. Okay, that's August 11th and 12th. That means yep, yep. go find a dark, dark place a little bit out of the city and places I can recommend I don't know you know you can go to uh, um, up into the uh, Santa Cruz mountains that's a good place to go um, if you head uh, east into the you know Mount Diablo range or get a campsite at Mount Diablo that's a good place to go um, if you go to uh, the uh, hills around Morgan Hill, that's, that's a good place to go. Uh, um, there's some really dark state parks out in that direction. Kind of want to get away from the city lights just so you could see um, more than the occasional bright meteor. What's really amazing about a good meteor shower, if we luck out and we hit uh, a dense part of the uh, of the cloud that we're passing through, cloud of material that we're passing through, is you could really see the radiant. You could see that coming from this location of the sky, there's all of these little pebbles hitting the earth and they scatter out in a pattern where it's, it's like driving on Highway 5 and going through a cloud of insects. And there's suddenly all of these little dots coming towards you. And I've really only seen that phenomenon a couple of times, once from the Perseids and once from the Leonids, and which was a phenomenal um, uh, experience. To, yeah, that was in what, that. Two, 2002, I think it was. Yeah, it was, yeah. It was back around then, exactly. Yeah, yeah, and was... uh, where it was, it wasn't just one or two meteors every, you know, oh, no. every few seconds. It was just this steady stream. It was like looking into a shower head and seeing the water come out, the water droplets yeah. come out towards you. is the only way I could it, it, describe it. My fondest memory of that meteor shower was going home about five o'clock in the morning with a sore neck <laughs> from my head tipping back every time the, another meteor went by. <laughs> so yeah, you just wanna find yourself a dark location and you know, don't try to look in any one part of the sky. Best thing to do is kind of you know get a blanket laid out on the ground and just kind of stare up in the sky. Yeah. The radiant is in the eastern part of the sky, but meteors will show up in any part of the sky. So you don't want to restrict yourself to just looking in one direction. And the Perseids are known for having um, you know bright meteors at a lower frequency than the Leonids, which are lots and lots of uh, dimmer dimmer ones yeah um the uh don't bother with a telescope you, you don't need a telescope for a meteor power at at best at best you would want low power binoculars oh, but you I don't would, even really need that yeah, you just would, want a comfortable place to lay down and stare up at the sky yeah yeah you, you got to remember that you know a, a telescope gives you a very small field of view of, of the sky binoculars give you a bigger view but the typical uh, meteor streaking across the sky, it can go across a third of the sky. And that's way more yeah. than what you would see even in binoculars. You know, right. so. so bring a sleeping bag with you so you're sure. warm. And Being warm and comfortable is the main part of meteor shower 
and a thermos of hot chocolate. And yes, hot chocolate or whatever. Maybe a little something extra in the chocolate. (laughs) It's up to you, you know. (laughs) Um, What time for the meteors? Uh, Basically, figure that uh, on the 11th of August, uh, starting at about 11 o'clock or midnight, going till about three in the morning. Yeah, is that's yeah. your window of greatest likelihood? Yeah, the, the 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 maximum number is expected to be around between two and three in the morning, uh, but you should be able to see them all night. And if for some reason you can't go out that night, uh, one of the nice things about the Perseids is that it actually continues over a couple of nights. Uh, it's not there aren't as many you know in successive nights, but there are still quite a few. So if you can't go out the night of the 11th, go out the night of the 12th, and you still may be able to see them. Now, the moon is going to come up early in the morning of the uh, 12th. So uh, it will come up, uh, I think, around 1230, quarter to one. And it will be uh, a a waning crescent, almost a waning uh, or uh, last quarter. So there will be some light coming from the moon once it's up. So uh, that will cause you to have difficulty seeing the dimmer meteors, but still it should be a pretty good shower. And like Richard said, there are a lot of bright meteors with the Perseids. All right. Well, I think that's it for tonight. And, uh, you know, sorry, we couldn't open the observatory, but we'll give it another shot next week. You know, it's the, uh, that's the game we play. And don't forget to go out here in about uh, 15 minutes and look to the southwest uh, part of the sky, south uh, west by southwest. Look for a bright star that's moving. That'll be the uh, International Space Station. It'll only be visible for about three minutes. Uh, and if you're lucky, you might see a much dimmer uh, satellite, if you will, flying behind it. That'll be the Crew Dragon. So you want to check that out tonight if, if you don't have fog. All right. Good night, everyone. Good night.